Welcome. This is the October 8th Jalen Zones production user call. We have DCH, Antrenay Gion, Philip, Tara, and myself, Michael. And it sounds like, Dave, you made it to um, a recent OCI call. Can you tell us what's going on there? Because Doug has not been able to attend these calls. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I will. I'm just looking briefly awesome. for the link to the minutes. Here we go. Oh, and perfect. Then... Uh, and go ahead and drop it right in the doc. I'll put the doc link yep. in the chat um, because, hey, it's your doc as much as mine. Okay. I'll move it to the uh, to the minutes um, later. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we pretty much had a full house um, last week, and it was basically everyone catching up and aligning after um, conferences and, and, and related travel and so forth. Um, so the last week of the Podman testing update, um, uh, sort of the public testing um, is supposedly this week, but we want to keep it going, and we need to sort of prod more people to get um, to get more input on that. Um, and it's pretty cool. Some but the people working on it have also started fixing bugs upstairs in Pod Demand itself, and you can't ask for more than that in open source. Yeah, so first I fix your project, then I fix the upstream project. It's um, fantastic. Um, um, Alice is going to start using the jails mailing list for some of more of the OCI comms around it. I think that's pretty good because it increases the discoverability of um, jails for FreeBSD in, in general. So that's pretty cool. Um, the OCI container spec pull request that up that adds support for FreeBSD, sort of the official paperwork for FreeBSD for the um, OCI um, specification is pretty close to being done. And there's just a few little nitty pieces on that. So um, it, it's been slow progress, but it, it's it's great. And the main thing really is um, how we expose all of the three FreeBSD specific stuff in the container, um, the container spec. So what else have we got here? Um, Doug and I have sent two PRs in to get, um, so Fabricator Reviews actually, to get um, OCI build stuff happening in um, the FreeBSD release process. And we're both pretty excited about that. I need to rename some Oracle stuff so that it's not called Oracle Container Interface, but um, Open Container Interface. And Doug's stuff includes the builds. Um, I will link to a couple of those things. Um, we are the sort of group who's quite happy going and testing, building things from source. It would be really good if you can try this um, and um, let us know if that works or not. And if you've got any questions, um, the Jails IRC channel is a great place for it. Um, I, will, I will try and stay on top of things there. Um, we discussed a bit about package base and how that fits together. There's some sort of plumbing missing. Um, we need to have all the things nicely lined up so that when um, a new source um, patches are released, and new ports patches are released, then package base includes all the nice shiny things. And we need to have those lined up so it's easy to tell when you should fetch your new container images and if you do fetch them, what they'll get. Um, anything else around that? Um, Nort talked some stuff, talked about um, Netavark, which is the replacement, the, the Rust flavored replacement for the layer that handles networking. I'm not really familiar with that because I missed most of the summer holiday stuff. It'd be good to get him um, to explain a bit more about that. And that's that's about it. So, um, yeah, it feels like we're getting pretty close. How is that spelled? Netta Vark? Netta something? Ooh, let me just uh, see if I have a link for it. Cool. It's spelled, if, just imagine, um, here it is. Just imagine exactly how you would think it was. But with a K at the end, it's right, like a K. Yeah, Netavark. Uh, someone's typing on the typing. Go ahead and clean that up. Cool. Ah, thank you. Okay, any questions for Dave on regarding the OCI initiative? And I see that's getting a lot of press, for lack of a better term, in social media, which is great. People are loving that. Oh, and Antrenig, you had a lovely comment on uh, the good old days of Kubernetes. Maybe save that for later. That was intriguing. Uh, and 
I'll put this in there. So if there are no questions for uh, Dave, maybe Antrenig, let's hear your philosophical questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Good. So um, my problem is the following. So um, uh, my team made Jailer, which is a pretty okay uh, you know, jail manager. It lives in HTTPS jailer dot dev, and the point of jailer is is we love the idea of Docker, we hate the implementation, right? So that's that's kind of the situation that we are in. At um, the, the 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 interesting thing that happened is that we want to have a clear separation between a developer and an operator, which is not very clean when you do it with things like Docker. Uh, at least not the modern Docker. The, the old Docker, which had less features, was much more separate between what, what a user and an operator is. Another interesting f uh, part of Jailer is that it's not a service. It's actually a config manager. It's, it's a config file manager. So if you use something like Pot or Bastille or... Uh, literally anything else, they are a service. So you would need to do like service Bastille enabled, right? In Jailer, when you create a jail or anything like that, it's actually just a config file generator based on the command line arguments. So it's not abstraction, it's automation. So that's kind of our philosophy. So here's what, where I got the problem, right? I have something that looks like this, Jailer image list, which would list all of your images and the way that you would get it is from jailer image fetch and what jailer image fetch does is it 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 downloads base.txz it puts it in a in a zfs file system and then it does snapshot right that's what it does and when you do jailer create um, let's say web zero, then it would do ZFS send receive. It would do, uh, it would generate the jail.conf that's required. And it would modify the rc.conf inside the jail, right? So it's it's just an automation. It, there, there are no abstractions, it's just automation. So over time, my team integrated package base they integrated, kindly integrated OCI. Uh, they also integrated what we would, what we like to call uh, app, app jails. These are what we like to call like thin jails instead of thick jails uh, on the Docker side sort of, of the philosophy. And we also integrated uh, kind of a very stupid uh, registry. It's basically just an NFS or web server where the ZFS files exist. Of a jail, you just you know ZFS receive them and you're done. So uh, the question is, what is an image? That's what the actual question is. Like, what yes. is an image? And of course, the OCI people have a spec for that. Like, you actually need to have a spec to understand this is what an image is. But when you're creating an image template that you're deploying jails from. If it's created over package base, or is it created over OCI, or is it created over a custom application that you wrote, or we actually have another integration, we call it Linux base, which are a bunch of scripts, which tells you, hey, if you if you want Debian, that then I'm going to install Deb Bootstrap, run the following commands to have an Ubuntu jail, and then I'm going to run a bunch of other commands to make sure that you can boot it, because you know, you need to have a, a, a bootable system. Or the same goes with Void Linux, Dev1, Gen2, those are the easiest one to use, at least. Anything that's not systemd is pretty easy, right? So we have like a bunch of these layers of automation to, to get a final artifact that we call an image. But the, the, philosoph the philosophical question of what is an image is still stuck in my head, which is kind of conflicting with the idea of a command line CLI, right? So... Let's say you want to create a free BSD. Uh, let's say you want to create an image template, but that image template should be generated not via package.txe, but rather with package base. So would that be jailer image fetch dash dash package base? 
would that be Jailer package base create? So that's where the whole idea of what an image is came from. And I would love to hear feedback and ideas, problems that you see with this, questions, anything. Um, and by the way, we are not married to backwards compatibility. Like the first line on GitHub says, we, you, we created this because our customers need it. Expect breakage until version one. So if we can easily break things uh, if anyone has, you know, if, if you need to break things. Um, I would say the image is basically the a fi single file which describes the jail file system. So that mm -hmm. can be a tarball, it could be a ZFS replication stream, it could be any basically anything you can turn into a mount point. The question is, does it contain additional metadata uh, to handle the configuration of the content? So do you know which start command to run or not? Mm -hmm. What you're describing would be in Linux lingo with the first with the package base create would be a Docker file, not not an not an image. So those are the, or a Bastille file uh, if you want to FreeBSD non OCI gel manager example. Or with yeah, I see. It, it gets murky uh, when you look at things like port where it's just. An, because the problem is to actually use the image, you need to know how to invoke it. So basically how to populate your jail conf. And yeah. I see. So so so, so my team does have an idea of that. We we actually named it uh image source, uh taking inspiration from packet source, right? So where it would be kind of a, a syntax where you would define how an image should be created. And it could be custom, could be base.txz, could be package source. Like, here are the things that you should run to get an overall end image. You, you see what I mean? And I love the idea that you said, by the way, of having a, of having a, a, a file that describes, a file that describes the jail file system that is jailable and should be run, including what to run, right? So like, is it a single command? Is it ETCRC? Um, that's it... a question if that's part of it. It's a question if it's part of it, I see. Because you could also, maybe you want to split that off so that you have the image and then some kind of runtime specification mm -hmm. which references an image so that you mm -hmm. have one spec, basically one type of file to, how do I get from build instructions to an image similar to how you take a FreeBSD port with its build instructions and compile yep. it. And the result these days is a package. Is a package. Yeah. Uh, historically, I see what you it mean. was an installed piece of software, but yeah. you basically have build instructions will give you an image. But that does not give you more than a default configuration for the service if one is included in the port. Mm -hmm. So then you would have something like a build file, an image file, and a runtime file. And the, ra and the oh, runtime file would okay. contain that. And it, the runtime file would reference, in some way, the image. And the, yeah. Maybe I see what it you would mean. also reference the build file. So basically, if you have this image, use it. If you don't have it, fetch it like this. If you can't fetch it, this is how you can build it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. I see. Okay. So any other uh, thoughts? Yeah, I had two thoughts. Um, the first thing was, what is an image when you compare it to, for example, a Beehive VM? Um, so mm -hmm. the VM, we are expecting a chunk of disk, basically a raw mm -hmm. box, and you don't know what's inside it. And mm -hmm. all the things you listed above, package base, OCI, app jails, registries, all of those assume that you have something that will eventually end up as some form of tarball, which lines very much up to um, Jan's comment about um, 
it's a, it's a it's a mountable file system. It's it's very mm -hmm. very. Simple. Um, so some of them support layers, some of them don't. But for me, mm -hmm. when I think of what's the minimum supported jail, it's a tarball of a directory. That's you. If you want to have a single file that you fetch, it's a tarball. Um, I guess you could make it a zip file, but then you would lose potentially lose things like um, yeah permissions and so attributes and permissions. Yeah, it's a, a single archive. Um, when I have a look at the OCI spec, which is the most sort of um, uh, fanciest one, it has metadata in it as well. And mm -hmm. if I could find the canonical thing, I would link to it, but I can't. Um, and it's got instructions on, um, like it's got some history fields. It's got some layers, which includes the hashes that are used to generate that tarball. Um, but that's fundamentally all it is. Yeah, you have a tarball and some layers it depends on. Um, yeah, I think that's probably pretty good. Um, maybe I, I should raise that. There's a, there's a final image, which is a tarball. And in the OCI spec, there is also a list of layers that it is dependent upon that you must fetch and unpack first. Mm -hmm. But you still end up with just a tarball at the end. And uh, yeah, I can't find the schema. I know it's here somewhere. I dropped the link to the image specifications uh, yeah. markdown file for the starting point. Exactly it. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. And by the way, like that's that's so one of my colleagues was like, why aren't we using the OCI itself? And uh, it it brought it it brought me to the, in the same room to another colleague who was like a minute ago before that conversation was asking, hey, can you recreate Kubernetes? But the one that got released in 2015, not the one that exists in 2024. Because I want that, but I want the simple version. I don't want the current complex. And it reminds me a lot of OCI when it was initially made by Docker in 20, I want to say 12, 13. It was so simple, right? But the current specification of OCI is like, it's not simple. And like, it, it, it feels like browsers in 2010. Like, there is no way you can make this from scratch anymore. It's so complex now, right? With yeah. so many exceptions, so that that's my worry of why I'm not using OCI for the default. I mean, at the end, we're going to need to support some things with it, but uh, but like that's like I want to keep it the simple as possible, uh, not 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 the not the all of the features as possible, right? So I just want to put that in up front anyway, because uh, so the goal is to have that. If you did that, um, I'll just share. Oh, can I share screen, Michael? Or is that going to get in the way of your stuff? Um, I want this one, that window. Um, like the, the OCI spec for the FreeBSD images that Doug's produced is, is really, is really, what are we trying to do here? There we go. It's really, it's really short, you know? There's, there's a, a tarball here with a single hash, that's our layer. So it's just a tarball. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's a bunch of um, arbitrary metadata before and afterwards. So can it's you make that bigger? Can you oh, that bigger? Thank you. Uh, can I make it bigger and have it on the screen? Different. Mm -hmm. what? <laughs> when I do that. Um, OK, it works. It's, it's, not, it's not super complicated. This is obviously, this is a single layer. This is the lowest layer mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, um, and tarball here. and that's that's not super complicated so if you wanted to manipulate that with a shell script i i wouldn't blame you at this stage it's when it starts to get multi-layer that that starts to get messy and then you really start wanting a proper programming language because nested json is you know is fiddly to deal with in shell scripts but um you could do that and then all you would end up with is this metadata plus the tarball which is exactly what you said earlier um not super complicated. What else do you have in here? Um, this directory. Um, I do not what these know what these files are. Let's see. see. BWF. It's probably the same thing, just different. Mm -hmm. They're all the same size, aren't they? Oh no, they're not. 
um, C2 is different. Uh, okay, what's different here? Uh, this tells us how it was built. Mm -hmm. But it's still just a single layer, a single diff layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, diff ID is just a single one. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Why are these different but almost the same? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, th th this, this is a very typical example of my worries, right? Like, uh, <clears throat> I I'm sure there's a historical reason, like not that I'm complaining in this case, right? But uh, we don't have that legacy. This is very much when people are amazed that Beehive is much faster than, than KVM. They're like, how? KVM is more famous. I'm like, well, KVM has a lot of legacy. Beehive doesn't. And this is exactly the scenario. It's like, hey, what if I do the exact same thing that you guys did, which I love, but now I did it with none of your mistakes? Because so, <laughs> like you've already done the mistakes anyway, um, which got me into here. All important floppy emulation. Of course, of course, you need floppy emulation. So, uh, okay, that, that also makes sense. Um, okay, so let me bring it to another question of mine. Um, uh, I had I shared a table with my friends a couple of days ago, as well as on the uh, Fediverse. Uh, Michael, can I paste an image in uh, in the in the document? Of course, you can. I'll go back to Thank share. You. I'll find that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to paste it right around here. Okay. I have no idea where images are. Okay, found it. So paste. Okay, there we go. So oh, that's that was a very nice paste. Um, so here is Maybe. I try to I Bias. try to have as much flavors as possible, right? So we have type base. That's what the base TXE is. We have type package base. That's like hey, now you can use package base. Okay. An image, which is like it's just a ZFS tar, it's is is either a ZFS file system or a tarball, like like Jan said. OCI, which I still don't know how I'm going to integrate that, but sure. And a jailer source or image source, which is the same idea as like uh, an overlay. Not sorry, as like Portridge or FreeBSD make uh, ports kind of thing. Is like here are a bunch of. Actually, maybe I should uh, pre prefix that with another statement. Sorry. Um, I was talking about creating this years ago, and my friend said, you can't create Docker Hub. You don't have that much funding. And then I said, but did you know that Gentoo is an amazing thing because it doesn't ship binaries. It just ships the source code for building those binaries. So I don't need to have Docker Hub. I just need to have all of the Docker files in a single place. So that's the idea of like image source, jailer source, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Is there another um, image type that I might have missed? Yes. So Pudria supports oh. creating images, and that would be the obvious oh. one. Yeah. But also the other thing is package-based. Those aren't actually images. They're just packages. Yes. But yeah. 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 I'm going to, yeah. That package, that tarball could be everything. So mm -hmm. I'd add Pudria in there and with the proviso that... Uh you could make Pudria produce whatever output you wanted for, for Jailer, for example. There's mm. plenty of other functionality as well. Like Pudria image is amazing. I should um, add that in here. Antonik, I'm still worried yes. that you're uh, setting yourself up for repeated confusion by throwing basically package base or the tarballs together with the customized thing. Because the, again, the Without a proper wrapper, the release uh, tarball or a package base repository is not a ready to use image. You kind of have to materialize it. No, I'm, I'm not saying these are the final things. I'm saying these are the source things. You see what I mean? These are these are not the final things. For example, Jailer doesn't just download the base and extract it, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to download this. I'm going to extract it. I'm going to snapshot it. I'm going to put it in a specific data set so you can query it later. I'm going to add some ZFS metadata so I know how to boot it, right? So those are the sources, not the destinations. That's what I'm trying to. But that's yeah. your image, the resulting ZFS, serialized in some form. Yes. The resulting file system. 
in content is your image. And to get it's the image content, to get it into an image, you have to serialize it in some way. That can be a ZFS replication stream if you're willing to totally commit to ZFS. Otherwise, it has to be something else, probably a tarball of some sort, which is very flexible, but also problematic. Because I see. Uh, tar is not a very precise specification. If you only call it tar, then yeah. if you say FreeBSD's tar with these settings, OK, then. <laughs> uh, uh, Dave, the ironic thing is a lot of the Illuria operating system images, our lower OS is actually built with <laughs> Pudria image, and somehow all of us forgot about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no one in the team remembered. Yeah, okay, good point. Uh, okay, I see what you mean. Um, okay, uh, okay, and my final question is, um, if someone if if you needed a new GL utility, but again, one of the confusing parts, a lot of the confusing parts actually, is that Jailer is not managing any of those. It's just, you know, it's just generating the appropriate configuration. What do you think is missing from the GL aspect? Sorry, from the image aspect of it. Like one thing that we integrated very cleanly is Michael's OCAM BSD. Right, I generate a jail using OCAM BSD. I put that image in a directory, or in this case, a ZFS data set, and then I snapshot it. Now it's an image, great. So like, is, is there something that I'm missing? For example, someone said, hey, can I do like jailer image import and pass it a tarball? And then now you just create the final image from the tarball. You see what I mean? Like, is, is there anything from the jail aspects that you think would be cool to have? Of course, the obvious ones are like import, export, um, um, yes. Push, pull. Yes, Jan. Um, what you need is the concept of, of a repository so that you don't have to hunt things down by mm -hmm. local path or content hash, but by human meaningful names. And that's basically where you, you need a naming service. Similar to what a package repository gives you in FreeBSD's package manager, or yeah. Docker Hub gives you, or, or other registries for OCI uh, images give you, so that you can reference an image by name, not by content or by path. I see. I see. OK. And Makes the, sense. So you need a list of, probably a list of registries. And it'd be, of course, you can't host everyone's uh, jail images, but you don't have to if you just host their hash and their URL. OK, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, I see what uh, you mean. This is to, even browsers understand that you can have a resource, uh, for example, from an HTTPS encrypted page to an unencrypted page with a content hash attached to that. OK. Um, it's only a flat hash. It's not a fancy Merkle hash tree or something. So if you want to write it from scratch, there are tools like B3, some, and so on, which can offer tree hashes and so on. I see. But in this case, okay. a flat hash is probably good mm -hmm. enough because you don't really care about subsetting the images. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another one, th one thing that another colleague pointed out when we were thinking about this is that, hey, um, there's a tiny difference between FreeBSD and, and Linux in the sense that if you have image source, which means the scripts that would generate the image, everyone's happy. But if you have the binary of that in the, let's say, the company's ZFS repository of images, well, then you also need to have a way to specify which version of FreeBSD does it run on. Because you cannot have a FreeBSD 14.1 jail on a FreeBSD 13.2 host. And I don't think that Linux has that problem. All right? Like they you kind can, of do. They kind because, of do? I wonder how yes, did they because, solve it. Uh, if your container image 
requires a system mm -hmm. call which isn't available in an old uh, kernel. You can't mm -hmm. run it on an old kernel unless the software has a fallback me method, which you, in theory, could do on FreeBSD. And so let's say you need some kind of fancy new feature and it doesn't exist in the old uh, Debian stable kernel you're running, then you mm -hmm. just can't run it. It will crash. Uh, okay. I don't know if they actually track the minimum kernel version you need. Um, it would be even messier when, if you try to account for backporting features into long-term stable distros like Red yeah. Hat. Yeah. Where they, you, at the end of a release, you end up with Frankenstein kernel versions with lots of backported drivers and stuff. Yeah, um, I mean... There's a there's a, there's a couple of billion dollars of market in there, but yeah, sure, it's a, it's a very big it's a very big mess. <laughs> yeah, um, so this can totally happen to you. And uh... but, but 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 like but like if 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 you do have a, an OCI image, a Docker image mm -hmm. that's that requires a new feature, and you don't have that new feature, would would something like Podman and Docker that... tell you that hey, you can't run this, or would you like download it? run it, and then you're like, oh, shit, my MongoDB is not running because it requires this specific feature. I don't know the if they uh, put that in some kind of manifest. Uh, I so see. They, I they will definitely tell you if you're trying to run the wrong architecture or OS. But uh -huh. on, I don't know how that hints handled on Linux, but on FreeBSD, it will happily work, obviously. You can run the Linux jails. And yeah. You, can, <laughs> you should be able to, to cross-run with Primo as well. Um, the metadata does have the version of FreeBSD in it, but I cannot find that to hand. Um, I see. I see. Because that would be very interesting to test. Like, hey, if I create a Docker image with this specific kernel feature that two years ago didn't exist, and then try to run that Docker container on a, on a, on a very stable but an old Debian, uh, and what would happen? That's that that's like my current yeah. Uh, not that I you know care, but rather I just want to learn of how the, the Linux world try oh. to solve that problem. Yeah. yeah, the way to do it is in some kind of repository would be to have basically ABI strings. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that at least FreeBSD ABI strings are per major release, and if you have, I don't know, right now we just ignore that problem in FreeBSD. But if you run um, older um, system, let's say you're running 14.0, um, mm -hmm. and there's something for FreeBSD 14 AMD 64, and it is compiled for 14.1, um, it may not run because it's unsupported. Mm -hmm. In practice, these breakages are uncommon and minor, and especially uncommon among the things you can do inside a jail. But in theory, it's totally possible. I think uh, an example would be something which uh, depends on uh, copy file range. Uh, copy, uh, yeah, copy file range. That system call was. MFC somewhere into 13. And if you had a 13.1, which would have an ABI string of FreeBSD colon in uh, 13 MD64, the 13.0 didn't have it. And 13.2, I think, has it. So if you have a 13.2 um, jail and try to run it on 13.0, that of the ABI string alone won't tell you that you can't do it. Way yes, but FreeBSD but things like things like packages is by basically saying if something is end of life, yeah. You if, uh, and otherwise we're always building on the oldest supported minor release in each major release, so that we are always building with a minimum system version. But uh, not I guess the you could get one in each uh, release. Yeah, by the ABI string, you mean it would be like fourteen. 13, but on the other hand, I could use yep. something like uname dash capital K or uname dash capital U, which is an integer number, which, which you know, uses yep. the, okay, the makes sense. Dash K is the one you should probably track. 
Yeah. Now that's the uh, well date, which isn't a okay. date anymore. Makes sense. And you, that's the ABI version, uh, the low level one. And that would tell you the difference. Uh, it would even work for stable and current. Um, yeah. Okay, makes sense. And the finally, is already uh, FreeBSD packages, for example, contain that as annotations. Yeah, it's kind uh, of hidden in the metadata, which yeah. Yeah, uh, and finally, my last question is, and this is for like my plans for next year is, if you were to be using, if you are using Kubernetes, I want to know why, or like if someone ha had to create a a mini Kubernetes with like FreeBSD specific things, what kind of features would you be looking for? Because uh, I come from Erlang world and Kubernetes is like redundant because the whole point of Kubernetes is to make software reliable. And my solution to that is like, hey, write reliable software. You know, that's kind of a very good reason to write reliable software. While many people are like, hey, my software is not reliable. So I need something that makes my software less breaking so hey i'm using kubernetes so it can restart things so that, that that's kind of weird for me but that's what people are using uh, but i can see the value of that whenever i'm outside of the erlang world when i need to like help customers with python or god forbid no js you know so it, it becomes a whole other mess uh, my, my clients care a lot more about the scalability aspect. It's the it's like the you know the broke person that's voting for low taxes for rich people because they think that they're going to make a billion dollar app, so they spend an extra five hundred bucks a month on you know Amazon Kubernetes so that they can you know so that if they get uh, you know ten thousand customers at once, it will auto expand. So that that's that's why my clients have. have you know, either push for it or used it. And then, you know, and then I might have to talk them into uh, sharding their service a different way. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's the, I think it's auto scalability. That's, that's more, tr more necessary. I mean, in the ZFS world, to do an async cluster is so, so easy. And I mean, based on your jailer model, it's nothing like it's, it's no, no effort whatsoever to do a, a warm failover instantly. So I don't think I don't think that's the part of Kubernetes that uh, that counts. I think it's the scalability that's that's the most okay. that's the most key point for most people. Can I say something from the ops perspective of Kubernetes, which is <laughs> out of please do out of scope. I mean out of of the equation most of the time. Most of the time I see from customers to adopt Kubernetes just because they don't have to deal with the host. Uh, they don't have to deal with updates or yeah, uh, okay. mostly That's... for compliance. So it's like we don't know how to use package managers, we created Docker. We don't know how to use operating system, we created Kubernetes. Exactly. And that doesn't uh, sound like a problem for my customers. <laughs> and since the Docker containers are someone else's responsibility, uses usually by third parties, they're not the problem. So you I'm so sorry, I'm actually is, I'm no, it's, it, I, Tara, is, is this, so you, you think that there's a, so I, I, I get embroiled in compliance stuff all the time. And I, I've actually sort of worried about clustering from a compliance standpoint, because you can't trust all of the individual components, but you're saying that a lot of people believe that they just feel comfortable with it because it's so widely used, so widely deployed. They don't have to, then they can write it off as not a risk. Uh, Daniel, you're sorry if I'm saying this, I'm hoping I'm not too harsh. You're confusing compliance with security. Okay, so I see. Se security is what you're saying, okay? And right. I'm coming from a security background, so I'm worried as well. But I'm saying compliance, which means ticking the box, okay? Right. Especially right. most of the time, Kubernetes, and I'm going to a company tomorrow with that has it inside. I cannot tell them everything because it's recorded. Um, and uh, most of the time, customers go with not on-prem Kubernetes, but on public cloud Kubernetes, so it's someone else that is managing the updates. Right. 
Right. It's, it's That's what I've seen in in my in my cases is mostly delegating responsibility. Right. Okay. How about okay. you ask? That a hundred percent makes sense. But I, I you know, I Not still that I struggle agree, to, okay. Yeah, no, I it just I I, uh, I you're a hundred percent right. I guess I'm just like I don't know I, I don't know how a compliance department I mean I guess I guess they for large companies they just they just do. There's somebody to to say here's the you know, here's the checkbox, here's the uh mm. it's it's not our it's not our risk anymore. Um yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe when I do compliance reports I'm being too too security minded and <laughs> I'm costing my clients too much money. Based on someone who worked with you, I can say that you're doing compliance the way that it's supposed to be, not the way that people do. Uh, that That's also a big problem Sticky, with my customers. Boxes, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I tell them, hey, you were doing this standard. It's going to take you nine months. And then they're like, well, your competitor told me it takes two weeks. I'm like, my competitor is dumb. So <laughs> it's 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 a it's a big it's a big problem in that compliance as a whole. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really uh, really important for me to to make sure that I'm thinking about that distinction between compliance yeah. and security. Um, yeah. Matthias had something to say, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I would add to that the the to those to those uh, very good reasons uh, the ability to reproduce uh, or to, to create an environment where you can orchestrate uh, and build, so orchestrate services and control how they're uh, linked to each other, uh, the, whole, uh, um, the whole stuff that you can do with uh, VNet jails and, uh, and this equivalent. And if you take all of these together, I mean, that, I think that's probably part of the a big part of the attraction, uh, so isolation and the capability to isolate uh, services and to isolate, um, so isolation fr between services and isolation from the host, right? you protect the host. Uh, the scalability, the ability to build those, uh, um, those uh, orchestrated uh, and galaxies or environments of, uh, of uh, services, the compliance, super important that's that's uh, that's true and you provide it as a so let me put some air quotes in air quotes around uh well documented um an environment with well documented ways of doing things right mm. it's i would say it's probably a poor man's uh, version of what you can do uh with uh, uh a sane uh, foundation, and it's. I don't think that the way it's done is a sane foundation, but it it works. And I think that if we ignore that um, the, the value that this, pro I mean, it's a lifesaver for a lot of people because their choice. Uh, it's not like they they have a well documented uh, way of doing this. Uh, using FreeBSD, right? And uh, or where there is a uh, um, one way of doing it, right? The, for instance, if you look at FreeBSD, you have a super fragmented uh, landscape with 10 different ways of doing things, uh, which change all the time. Uh, and there is no, it's a standard Kubernetes, if you want. And the containerization mm. of services. That's a standard, and even if it's a bad one, and even if people are spending hours complaining about and the headaches and the, they, they have to build huge teams around it, it's a standard that prov lets them focus on building stuff. And it's terrible to see how much, how many resources are, are spent on something which is intrinsically uh, uh, unsafe, is doing a lot of things in a way that I wouldn't consider best practice and all that, but at the same time is super attractive because it exists, right? And my, my uh, intimate conviction is that if we had an equivalent uh, based on FreeBSD and we can, 
and it's a big if uh, uh, if we can uh, uh, win back the the marketing uh, um, uh, battles uh, to to for this solution to be considered. Uh, I think a FreeBSD based solution would wipe out of the the face of the earth uh, uh, something like everything built around Kubernetes. But it's not uh, it's not a small thing, you know, to have tens of thousands of people who are specialized. And I'm not only saying that from the point of view of, uh, yeah, you have these armies of people who have a vested interest in discontinuing like that, but it's really a way to get things done. And if we don't yeah, take that I, into, into consideration... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, my, my, my thing is like, when Node.js came out, I was in love. Right, even as someone who hates JavaScript, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then five years passed, I'm like, your ecosystem became shit. And then when Rust came out, I'm like, amazing thing. And then 10 years later, it's like, I cannot understand a single line of code anymore. And when Kubernetes came out, by the way, initially it was like a bunch of shell scripts. <laughs> it's like just a bunch of bash scripts. I'm like, this is amazing. This solves so many problems. And then now it's been 10 years since Kubernetes has, has came out. It's like, yeah, there's there's no way that a single person can learn this. Let's say even over a weekend. So that that that's like my problem with this. Is like th that's my issue. On the other hand, I learned Pascal in school, and I can still read any Pascal code, any modern Pascal code for any platform in this year. It's like it's it's not that there hasn't been innovation in Pascal. It's just like the the language is so good. You know the Lada ad. Like BMW changes the car design every 10 years, but the Lada, the Russian Ladas are exactly the same from 1950. It's like it's perfect by design. It's a but like fiat. the big yeah. yeah. So that, <laughs> that's <laughs> so that, that's one of my that's one of my issues with 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 Kubernetes. Like I love the idea, absolutely, but it, it's so complex right now that I cannot and the other thing, Matthias, is you said is right. Like I, I had a customer where we deployed Elasticsearch. And I deployed it on FreeBSD. I deployed it high availability with the weirdest way possible using CARP. Of course, the customer has never ever heard of CARP. Like that's very typical of, of such customers. And then they deployed, deployed their version, which wasn't production. It was actually for staging using Kubernetes after they moved to the, you know, the fancy clouds, not like the small European Hetzner clouds. And, uh, and, and they were amazed that my system has never gone down. And I had to show them that like, I'm not using any of the fancy tools, but I have all of the availability. Because for some reason, some people think that in order to have the high availability, you need Kubernetes. You, you see what I mean? That's my problem with the market. It's like they think that you need it. You can't ship software without Docker. You can't have reliable infrastructure without Kubernetes. I'm like, no, no, no. We've been doing this for 20 years, and we will still be doing it for, for 20 years. Uh, th that's that's my, my my problem with it, per se. So, yes. Hey, that, but that's exactly the reason, I think, why... Uh, um, I mean, that, that way of looking at the, the problem, which I'm, I'm, I don't disagree with. I, I think you're right. But... For uh, most of the people who take the decisions on we are going to use Kubernetes, uh, the question is not how reliably do I mean uh, uh, do I have uh, do I have uh, I mean how often do I need to restart my my uh, infrastructure and all that mm -hmm. and that that measure of uh, of uh, reliability. Uh, it's more about two things. Uh, can I can I build sufficient uh, resilience into the system so that even if things are not reliable and substandard, uh, but when I need them, I have I. Did you cut out? You're breaking up for me. You and froze. your video is frozen. I do have some observations too when you have a moment. Yes, sir. Sounds like we're uh, talking. <laughs> Matthias has the floor, but he's also frozen. It's very cute. Let me get a screenshot. Okay, so um, observation <laughs> really number indeed, one. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Entrenic, based on what you said about, wow, the early Node.js is great. Ooh, the early Rust is great. Ooh, the early Beatles are great. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it sounds like we need to break down these tasks into individual functions and then line them up and use your language of choice at every step, as opposed to here's this monolithic beast that tries to do all of it. And tightly related to that, listening to every co Docker conversation to date, it's tell me you have a 1990s overriding file system without telling me you have a 1990s overriding file system. We're generally spoiled with ZFS. And it's like, wait, all these all these acrobatics of ripping open tar files and layering them and then doing all this stuff. It's like, wow, mm. that is like 1990s with uh, modern sensibilities slammed on top of them, but not the modern tooling. So uh, I, what the answer is, I think we just break up the tasks, leverage the tools we have effectively, and of course, try to agree between any two administrators how to do it. And I think there's some progress to be made. There, I said it. I hope you're back, Matthias. No, it, yeah, it's it's perfect. Yeah, because 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 because, and I hope Matthias is back. Because my, my, when when my friend said, "Can you redo Kubernetes?" My first idea was, everything that Kubernetes can do, I can do with FreeBSD in base tools. Exactly. Like you know, listening to multiple IPs. What's restart, base, Grandpa? You know, it's like there is no notion <laughs> of that in, FreeB in Linux, GNU Linux, or GNU or. Uh, uh, busy box Linux or whatever combination of aggregate stuff you have. Um, there's no standard. Go ahead, Jan. Michael, the yes. how our story is that Kubernetes is already the modular monster. Ah, great. It is not just, there is no one true Kubernetes. It's a handful of companies have actually built Kubernetes stacks which work for them and supposedly their customers. And so you have to make like 50 choices uh, of which implementation you pick before you get from Kubernetes to the thing people think of when they say Kubernetes. Yeah, there, is like Kubernetes okay. there is like Kubernetes, there is Cree, uh, there is K3S, the AWS Kubernetes has two different implementations, by the way. Google has one, Azure also has two different implementations, and Volter has their own implementation with their own namespace. It's like, it's not a program, it's a namespace of APIs. Like, that's what it is. So, for me, this sounds messy. Like, I like Kubernetes because like, oh, it's, it's a single Go binary. You run and you're good. You know? <laughs> and now it's like, oh, is this big monster that turned into... So that's that's kind of my 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 my, my issues. And I, I, I don't know how to... Because again, when, when my friend and customer said, can you solve this problem? I'm like, it's solved for me, kind of. Maybe you just need some, you know, configuration on top of it. So you don't have to do things manually. Like I can automatically create BGP for you. I can automatically create COP for you, but like the base itself can do this. Yes, yes, Dave, you were saying something. Yeah, so, so, so two things. So going right back to the beginning, why do people choose Kubernetes? Um, one customer I worked with used it because they had about um, 150, 200 developers and they had their production systems and their dev test and QA stuff. And they needed a way to shovel stuff from developer does things through all of these different channels and different types of testing. And Kubernetes was the only way they had to go, okay, tear down this um, staging environment, recreate it, apply the new patch from the developer, hand it over to QA to go and do their stuff. And it does that really well. Um, I think the other sort of general, general comment is Kubernetes has become the operating system layer for the cloud. Network, almost for the cloud on, on that everything else is built on. And so what happens for a customer is if you are a small to medium sized business, you are not big enough to have your own sysadmins, you do have your own developers, you can hand over the whole ops problem to your cloud vendor and they will provide everything. They will provide the um, certification you need for security audits. They will do the security and configuration stuff will generally just work for you until it doesn't, and then you'll discover that you can't introspect this environment because you don't have the ability to do so. Um, but for better or worse, that's 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 where it is. Exactly. You hand everything over to them until you can't, and then you go sort of, what do you do now? Um, 
And every roughly every year, I have at least one customer who turns up and says, um, I think we need to de-Kubernetes size our stuff. And the answer is <laughs> for many, many people, many organizations, it's too big and too complicated. And th there are many that do just fine with Kubernetes. But I, yeah, if you've got just like a, a couple of hundred servers, it's probably overkill. One of the really killer features, so this is going back a few years, why did VMware become so successful? It's because they saved customers an enormous amount of money on unused hardware. And containerization is another one of those waves where all of a sudden you can pack things even tighter together than before. And Kubernetes is one, one way of doing that. So the story from vendors is they come in and say, you know all that money you save with VMware, hey, let's do it again with, with Kubernetes and with containers, you'll save even more money. That's a very, very attractive proposition. Um, even if some of that savings is we're going to slash your um, your ops team um, and network team in half. I, I wish that part was true, though, because... Uh, you end up when, having a Kubernetes ops team, uh, and a, a chaos team, yeah. Yeah, because because so. because when when I tell people that I manage five hundred servers for a customer alone part time easily, they're mm -hmm. like, "You can't do that." I'm like, what, "What do you mean I can't do that?" And they're like, "How are you been following all of the updates on all the servers?" I'm like, "PKG audit. It just sends an email." Uh, they're, they're, like they're so confused, you know. And uh, you know, my other customer is like, "Yeah, we have like three hundred servers and a team of ops of five. I'm like. The, the, the math is not mathing. So it's, 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 yeah. three to four There's thousand. no contradiction here. Uh, three to three to four different thousand. applications need different amount of hand-holding. Yeah, that's definitely true. That is true, though. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, uh, this was a very nice Kubernetes rant of all of us, I guess. Um, uh, this does give me some good ideas of like what do people like about Kubernetes, and uh, all, everything I got is about standard standardization, right? Standardization to make sure that all of your environments work exactly the same way, and that's a very good thing to have. Yes, it works on my Although, box. Ship my box. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, um, and yeah, it, yeah, I'm, yeah. And in the Unix world, I mean, SmartOS solved this a long time ago. Um, Matthias, you, you're back. <laughs> we have back, a sorry for... shot of you doing this. You know, so... <laughs> yeah, sorry for the rant mode. Um, it is but it's so it is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Antronic, I'm I'm I just want to I'm slightly worried when I hear uh, or concerned when I when I hear what you were saying before about uh yeah, who needs OCI? Uh, that's not what you said, but uh, in a way, yeah. uh, uh, you know, jailer can be uh, uh, much more than than or provide everything that's needed without going through OCI, which I I, I kind of heard is bloated and uh, has so much legacy, uh, etc. And I'm afraid that if that uh, mindset. Uh, governs our uh, how we we look at this uh, we end up with another brilliant solution or set of solutions that no one in the industry will be looking at yeah so yeah a little bit of a little bit of overhead um, but something that people can relate to in my book is worth a million in terms of if, if, uh, efficiently reaching out uh, to to the masses if you want uh, 10 million times something which is super efficient, but that no one is going to be, uh, you know, it takes them away from from uh, from uh, uh, what they know, what they're comfortable with, and not only in a, uh, and I would say mostly not in a lazy way, but just because they have to ship stuff, right? So relearning a complete different stack, nobody is going to do that. So I, I could see a trajectory where we do, uh, uh, you know, uh, we use OCI compliant uh, uh, um, containerization on FreeBSD that uh, lets them use their uh, existing uh, or 
slightly modified, but mostly existing uh, uh, Docker files, understanding of how these things should be should be built, and where in ten years' time, uh, when through that, that's a gateway drug, right? Once they have mm -hmm. tasted, they, they came for the 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 version of what they knew that it was slightly uh, stabler, but uh, basically the same stuff, to being in contact with everything else. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we can move later to something that makes sense, that gets rid of the bloat, etc. But we have the people with us. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Because like people who are refugees, like Tara and I, is like, hey, Debian modified net networking stack. Or like, hey, Debian is now using systemd, so I'm moving to FreeBSD. We are a much a small number than the people who are like, I just need the OCI stuff on a stable system. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go with FreeBSD. That that could easily be our get and especially with the, the a lot of the things that we have that others don't have, like DTrace and ZFS. It could be a very nice gateway drug. I just solved a problem today with Dtrace, and the customer was like mind blown. Like you can see who opened the file. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so it 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 could easily be a very nice gateway drug. And then we're like, hey, you might also want to check out Carp. You might also want to check out you know whatever other things FreeBSD has as a as as a way to do that. Yeah, I agree. I yeah, I I think I I'll think about this. Let me put it this way. I think I'm gonna have some good amount of thinking about this, yes. Ah, oh, Philip's been patiently waiting, but it sounds like a bit of a beehive question. Maybe we can give him a little poke in the right direction. Oh, no. Yes, uh, Philip, I wanted to ask, is that a UFS file system or a ZFS file system? Well, actually, there's multiple things. So I'd worked with mm -hmm. some external developers on a few different projects. And so the beehive one is, you know, they used some... Uh, prepackaged uh, uh, Linux-based things on uh, AWS and uh, Google Cloud in particular. But, uh, you know, just giving some uh, uh, shout outs to the other big clouds, because I'm sure that that'll come up. Uh, and then some things were built on uh, FreeBSD, uh, including jails on the, the FreeBSD. So it would have to be nested jails. And right now, the, the current plan is, so you have external developers who are you know, basically making a prototype or a, a demo, uh, and then what's the next step for bringing it as an in-house sort of a uh, a product uh, to say, okay, you have uh, something that's on a cloud. How do you bring it in without manually redoing everything? So that's that's really what the question, the question is. is. That right now, the manual bring it in is the process. Uh, but if there's a semi-automated way to say, okay, you have a uh, a snapshot or an image uh, in in the cloud model. Uh, how do you bring that into a if it's a ZFS uh, sort of a thing? How do you bring that in? Uh, and if it's uh, for the Beehive call, if it's say a Linux image, how do you bring that in for a uh, a Beehive image? So just to yeah. say, do we have a, a simple way that's documented in like the handbooks or a, a blog at this point uh, to yeah. to in house something? So, so my blog post is actually about the whole root on ZFS. Like you can move a whole root file system to a new machine, and that's how I migrate machines usually. I just attach them together to a network and do ZFS send receive. In my case, I also did, I think in that specific blog post, is like, hey, save it to a tarball, move the tarball to the other system, and then just, you know, receive the tarball on ZFS. So you can do exactly the same thing with jails. Is like, make a snapshot, send the snapshot, receive the snapshot. I'm just wondering what kind of a jail manager are you using? Because if you're using jail conf, you're golden, just copy paste the files, right? And modify IP addresses and whatnot. But if you have uh, a jail manager, maybe they also need to move their configuration, right? Well, and actually the uh, the one that is being moved is, was just a handbuilt jail.conf. Uh, but I know that there have been... Uh, you know, I over the years I've tried multiple different ones uh, and haven't really settled on a particular jail manager other than uh, mm -hmm. Michael Lucas's book on how to <laughs> do it by hand because they've all broken in in different ways for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I have the feeling. Yeah, yeah. I know the feeling. Uh, yeah. In that case, you should copy the jail file. 
change the IPs either in the RC conf of the jail or inside the jail conf of the jail if you're using, you know, inherited or new stack instead of VNet. And finally, uh, if it's ZFS send receive, if it's UFS, then rsync the, the the jail root directory would solve all of your problem. Uh, one thing I would be very careful of is the obvious, which is uh, make sure that the host uh, can run the jail, the, the you know the major version of the of the of the operating system, but the major and minor. And another one that always is an issue with me whenever I move jails from a from one infrastructure to another is that the jails also need to talk with each other. You know, if you have, let's say, a web server jail and a MariaDB oh, yeah. jail and a, yeah. So like, it's like, okay, now, that's, now, now that's not like a jail problem. Now that's like a MariaDB problem <laughs> that I have to solve the permissions. That's that's always the biter. That actually takes longer than migrating jail itself. Well, and that's why it's been hand done in the past. Uh, nice. You know, so it's just, uh, you have the software, you bring the configuration over within a jail so that the jail locally is created from scratch. And I was oh, just I thinking, see. so I was thinking, is there some um, automated way, you know, to, to bring uh, uh, either a, a free BSD system into a jail uh, from one of the clouds or, uh, or, I mean, jails when it's ZFS has been pretty simple to, to migrate. But I was thinking about the cloud-specific things. To be clear, on the cloud, that's indeed already a jail, or it's a container or VM, and you're trying to free BSDify it. Depending uh, you want to import a virtual machine running in the cloud into a jail? Well, and yes, and and that's uh, one of oh. them in particular. It's a uh, a free BSD running on uh, Google Cloud that was manually created. Ah, but it is free BSD mm -hmm. already. That key question there. Okay. Yeah, and the okay. the so Linux one is the, for the Beehive call. The, okay. the obvious one would be to uh, ignore what guest operating system is. Use the cloud API to download a snapshot of the the virtual machine's disk and then uh, import that into Beehive, which at that point, yeah, you can run Beehive in a jail. It a, takes a bit of setting up, but it works. Um, um, another of those, yeah, we have the mechanism, but it's under-documented, and you have to assemble it yourself, pieces of FreeBSD. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think the easiest one would be for a, for moving well, a FreeBSD host to a FreeBSD jail is if it's ZFS then a snapshot send receive if it's not ZFS then just rsync the files or uh, get the disk from the cloud provider and then just mount the disk and copy the files right um, that's like the obvious if scenario. it's UFS that's not a problem you can take a dump and then mm -hmm. restore onto a ZFS file system. Who the hell named a dump? It's 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 very weird saying it in a <laughs> sentence. You can, I'm going to take a dump. Uh, I, I mean I mean ZFS. Uh, sorry, a UFS no. dump. Ah. <laughs> you, you're dumping something somewhere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it's UFS, you can use uh, yeah. case, uh, L flag to get because it was finally restored, even if you're using. Uh, journaling so that you can now take an atomically snapshotted uh, number of the UFS file system again. Um, and if it's running the latest version, if it's something you rather not want to uh, say the version of, okay, then it's probably not um, available, then you would have to uh, Mount the file system read only during the migration if you want a consistent uh, file system snapshot. So log in, mount all the file systems uh, read only with a mount dash u uh, dash r. Um, probably stop every application other than SSH beforehand, and then you can stream it over the SSH into your new system where you then can restore it. I would, if you have. Um, I infer from it running in uh, the Google Cloud that it's not an enormously large uh, VM. Oh, sorry. 
So it wouldn't be a problem to just spool the file system content to a um, to a file on your on-prem system, or um, you could even just once all file systems are read only, you could just send the disk through SSH with cat basically, uh, if you have a reliable network connection at least. Then you get a raw dump of the disk, just bit for bit, uh, which you can then use uh, MD config on the receiving system to make available as a, what Linux calls a loop, uh, so that you have the MD device. And then you can turn basically with whatever tool you want from CP-R to uh, Async to uh, something custom, copy the file system content out. You have so many options. <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's, that's what I mean. What I've just fallen back to was what was comfortable for me, which was uh, bring over the specific software and, you know, basically rebuild it uh, from a, a from scratch, you know, using uh, mm -hmm. a local known config and then just pulling in the individual software rather than, hey, is there a fast way uh, like uh, you, you, like when it's Beehive, you just pull in the, the disk image and you run it. Uh, yes. And so that's why I was wondering if there's something like that with a free BSD uh, ZFS on root, which is what uh, you'd written. So I'm going to give that a try just to test it. Uh, yeah. yeah you, you, you could try my blog post, but instead of putting it on root, you can put it on jail or you can put it on root. So like you can move the yeah, host One of over. the problems you will encounter, which uh, is that uh, at free BSD, uh, defaults to using a boot environment compliant pool layout. And that doesn't really work for a jail without extra helpers. Uh, Wait, so what? you would have to then make the, um, the receive the root data set first and then receive mm. everything but the root data set so that you uh, turn it I into the natural inheritance order again for the jail wait do you really need because i've done a root on zfs migration and i don't think i needed to do that wait a second where's my blog post if you uh, do it physical to physical or vm to vm you don't have to but if you want the, oh, the oh, physical or virtual machine to become a jail yeah, yeah, yeah. then you have to undo the boot environment uh, data set layout Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. At that, I mean, at that point, it might be just easier to do an rsync of the root file system or or the snapshot of the root file system. You know, well, I would just tarble it. I would use tar for yeah, this. I was going to say yeah, yep. like just tarble the snapshot instead mm -hmm. of sending the snapshot. Right. No, you can't tarble the snapshot because it's you would have to use nullfs to reassemble the different snapshot mounts into a coherent uh, tree. Ah, uh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah your tar needs to cross. Uh, so in, in general, the, the um, for Phil, this stuff is hard because um, uh, at least of three things. The first one is your current cloud um, server has expectations about networking. It's got a particular network interface. It's got IP addresses. And then you move it into your other system, whether it's a jail or, or not, doesn't really matter. And the host name is different. The um, IP addresses are different. Uh, the network is, are is different. different. And, and when I deal with customers in cloud environments, we have all sorts of fun things like um, they have S3 buckets, which are no longer named the same thing. Um, and you have to figure out how you're going to deal with all of that sort of other cloud goop. Sometimes it's just as simple as moving a VM. Sometimes it requires moving all of the load balances, all the DNS. The list just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. It depends. But for this sort of thing in general, I like tar. Tar is very boring. Um, you don't need to worry about the ZFS stuff in there. You can just scoop it up, dump it in a jail um, in its own data set and go from there. Um, one migration I did mm, last year um, for a customer, we I used, um, what did I do? I took their entire server, checked it into Git, 
Um, so like a like a, like a twenty gigabyte Git archive. Um, it was a handcrafted oh. system that had been run for like for like fifteen years, um, and then I unpacked base.txz kernel.txz over the top and saw that what the diff was and then re dealt with that. Um, so that depends on how much knowledge you've got of the internals of, of your of the environment you're trying to migrate. But um, I did that first to remove the base and kernel stuff. Then I did the same thing for all the packages and narrowed down the time at which they'd built their packages from to about a two week period into the ports tree, then rebuilt the ports created those files and over the top of the Git ones, removed those. And after doing all of that, I was left with about sort of three or four gigabytes of application specific stuff, which needed hand crafting. Uh, but that was a particularly crafty one where there was nobody on hand who knew how this environment had evolved. It was like, it's there, it's stinky, please deal with it. Um, yeah. So yeah, we even found that we had a custom, slightly customized kernel build as well, just for funsies. That's why I like jails. Once you, even if you're using a cloud vendor, if you put your stuff in jails, then you can move them around pretty easily. And the only thing that's remaining is the networking. And then I use uh, something the like- Nice thing about so having your- The oh. XLAN to provide that mesh layer of networking so that the jails are independent of the provider. So uh, one of the nice things about putting stuff uh, into a jail instead of out of it is that it's easy to fix up the networking because you can use the host to change the configuration. So you can JXEC into your jail before the networking is reconfigured and then mm. use your installed editor to fix it up. Now, my, my philosophy for the host is like it has jails, it has VMs, and it has Tmux. That's all it has. Like there is literally, no, and of course, in my case, jailer, but like that's all it has. So, yeah. Uncle Dave has a small announcement. We can't hear yeah, you. Um, so we've talked over the last couple of years about adding metadata to jails. And um, I've asked um, Igor Ostapenko, who's another um, another one of our free BSD cronies, to have a look at doing this. And I hope in the next couple of weeks we'll have some sort of, um, for want of a better word, specification about what we're trying to do there. And the first part of this is to have um, writable, well, sorry, um, at least read-only um, metadata for jails with, with sort of simple tags based on the OSD stuff. So. Um, Expect some discussion on the mailing list in the next in the next few weeks. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, Philip. If you want, after the recording, we can stay, and if you have access to the system is now, we can have a look and like figure out what would be the easiest way to automate. I mean, we would need to look what by we would need to look what the existing system is, what the destination system is, and try to figure out how to move it from from the one to the other in the sanest possible way well and actually in in my case it's simple enough that i've already started the rebuild so i'm not um mm -hmm. I, i'm looking at okay what do we do in the future um mm -hmm. for example i have a, a physical uh development machine that's just a a 10 year old or 12 year old repurposed box uh and eventually i'd want to say okay how do we stage from that you know that things are uh installed on uh free bsd without jails uh from years ago and have just been upgraded, uh, like the physical to virtual model, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to look at all the different ways to make sure that we have some, you know, in the future, good documentation about how to do things better or a standard way rather than, you know, handcrafting everything every time. So it's not really an urgent thing right now. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, how do we standardize the uh, yeah. uh, virtual to virtual and physical to virtual to get more use out of jails? Yeah. Oh, Michael, that reminds me. My team also integrated the jailer export and import features. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and and it's it's really nice. It's using the jail dash e, uh, kinda. It's using the jail dash e flag basically, and the way that okay. you do it is is very fascinating, at least for me. But I mean, I saw so many bugs in there. I'm like, guys, I can't ship this. Like jailer. <laughs> 
export, let's say, dub, 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 zero, SSH, uh, and now it flew over. What the hell is wrong with Google Docs today? It's just it's, flying uh, I, everywhere. Yeah, it's flying. I don't, I can't, I'm losing it here. Um, Should I do a control Z? Are no, you typing? Me. I'm trying to type, but I'm trying to document what you said. Oh God, I, I have no idea where I am. It's just, okay, yeah. fine. I'm just uh, going to delete that. Okay. And go for back. Foo. I just gave you an anchor to search on. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like jailer export dub, 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 zero yep. SSA other host jailer import dub 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 zero or dub 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 prod if you want to you know so like i loved this this was so nice to see it and it it, it does it in three stages we took the idea from vmb high is like turn it down uh move the files uh and then move the configuration and the configuration is can be done like this or if you really want to you can also do like dash a a new ip slash range dash uh, what do you call that? Dash T uh, Eper bridge. Like you, you, you can just use the, the the create commands just like the import command. The difference is instead of using fresh FreeBSD, it's like okay, I'm gonna get the data from you know so many bugs in here. <laughs> I still have to finalize it. I love the idea. It's like hey, I'm just gonna SSH and push all the configuration as needed. Yeah. Yeah, and another friend had a had a had a terrible idea. Is like Jailer CTL. This is what I'm running on my laptop, right? So like this is Jailer CTL connecting to this is the vSphere of of Jailer. It's like Jailer CTL export uh, test host slash dub 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 zero. No, sorry, it wasn't like that. It was migrate to. Uh, another ho to to other host slash dot 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 prod, and yeah, this also has a lot of bugs. But you're kind of acting like a a, a proxy between these two machines in order to pass the data back and forth. And I love this idea too because uh, you might be in a situation where you have access to the two machines, but the two machines don't have access to each other, and you want to act like a proxy to move data back and forth between them. Yeah. Uh, but I'll see how it goes. I mean, again, these are the, 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 the designing a command line CLI is much harder than I expected. Antrenig, you mentioned that out of context a few days ago. Does mm -hmm. that mean you want to discuss CLI at all here? And I'd like to talk documentation in a second when you're done. You said Ma maybe I, the CLI I don't is kicking know. your butt or something, to paraphrase. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly true. I'll I'll need to I'll need to um I need to like print what the jailer CLI is now and the features that I want and the possible suggestion of uh what it could look like. But okay. before we push it to the GitHub production version, not the internal shitty version, I think we're one of the few companies where the internal version is much shittier than the public version. Uh I need I need to make sure that there are no confusions, so to say, you know, that's, that's one of my main worries. Um, so yeah, I, I need to think of it. I just need to like sit down and think. Okay. About well, I have a about... brief documentation, mm -hmm. philosophical question. So many books, such as a new book on mail servers takes sort of a holistic lifestyle approach where this is the mail daemon we use and this is the web interface and this is how you tie them all together to give you a a workable hopefully workable solution right so looking at my bookshelf earlier i see things like astonishingly from peter skrominch who sounds that's a very latvian name um pearl one-liners which is dozens of short little items and while we do want canonical documentation, while we do want a whole lot of things, it would sure be helpful to have dozens, if not hundreds of little items. And I think maybe Drew Levine with the O'Reilly articles a million years ago went through these one way to do things like, hey, here's how you, here are three different ways to splat out a jail to a vm or a jail to a jail or a jail to something else and i 
don't know if we have existing resources we can pull from, but to some degree, parts of the wiki are simply, here's the one way to do this thing, but with a little shepherding and management, I think that would be quite useful insofar as there are these tips and tricks and things like a, gee, a cookbook on PowerShell. Um, what would a FreeBSD administrative set of tips and tricks, which if they are those individual steps, you can clearly say what version it was authored on because some of those techniques from FreeBSD 4.3 do not apply anymore. Um, but when it comes to going to this, oh, you know, we love Kubernetes because it's all the things, but you're asking, why do we not just do it with these few simple steps in base? Well, are we adequately documenting these many countless awesome simple things you can do in base? I don't know. There's a thought. I don't know if I have an answer, but I'd love that's to. A, that's a, that's a very good point. Like in, in, in security, for example, we have the red team uh, handbook and we have the blue team handbook. Those are small handbooks. Like you could fit them in your pocket the size of a Kindle if you want to. And uh, it's like, how do I see all of the processes which are listening when I'm doing forensics? How can I see um, uh, which Windows process is the parent of which other process? Like, okay, just a small handbook of all the day-to-day -day things of a, of a digital forensics uh, person, right? We can basically have like free BSD handbook is now too much because we already have a handbook, but like the free BSD toolbook, you yeah. know, what is was... like a small... What was Drew Levine's book? I'm trying to remember. I'm drawing a blank. And I thought it did exactly that. Um, uh, Drew, I have it. Let me go take a yeah, look. What's, yeah, please. It's like, I know it's somewhere here. Uh, BSD book. And it was, and maybe it's as simple as updating that because, hey, it was the right thing. Drew Levine's latest biography. BSD hacks, 101 industrial tips. BSD hacks. Yes. Boom. So like, yeah. Uh, and that was from nine. It it doesn't show up really well. The best of free BSD basics. Oh, also BSD hacks, 101 tips and tools. Oh. So, uh, and I'm trying to get a year out of it, if it will tell me this was this, 19, 2004. This one, 2004. Oh, gee, and, it's, it's, it's been a minute. And this one's 07. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, copy image. Yeah, we need to update these. Well, you know, what what might make sense is I, I know that, you know, I, I just love Michael Lucas's books and such, but it might be nice to have a, a thin book that is a free BSD ops, you know, sort of a guide. Or, you know, not not all the things and everything, but here is a role that you might be hired for or specifically filling in for, and you need to keep the system running. What is it that you do to keep an existing system running? from an operator perspective. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah, because me and Michael, we were, we were thinking about writing like an MSP book for like managed service providers. Here's how you do LDAP. Here's how you do uh, Samba, ZFS, you know, all of the MSP mm -hmm. level things of an IT department. But the ops point of view, which is like running applications, mm -hmm. Is like there's an overlap of fifty percent, but the other fifty percent is totally different, right? Of like, you're not deploying a Samba, you're probably deploying an NFS cluster, you're probably deploying, uh, you're, you're probably packaging software, which is something that an MSP doesn't do usually. Packaging software, right? They just deploy it. So that's a very good point. Having a, an, an ops book as well as the MSP MSP book kind of like next to each other and. Uh, have that kind of documentation. Yeah, yeah, that would that would make total sense to uh, have like an ops cheat sheet. Uh, feeling stupid here. What are those daily greetings you log in? It says a tip. What are those tips? I'm fortune. Fortune. Thank you. Fortune. And there's also an, uh, a free BSD fortune bot on the Fediverse. Yes, there are. Remember fortune. to reinstall yeah. the offensive ones, right? Well, that's a different <laughs> yeah. topic. And. Yeah. For what it's worth, some of those are mighty old. <sighs> we should we should we should also add new things to Fortune as far as I can tell. Because I mean it's it does get updated, but there are so many neat features that no one talks about in, in there, maybe. I don't know. The ops thing, for example, that really is interesting for me is 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 um, a lot of the D-Trace stuff. Uh, I mean, yeah. we do have a D-Trace one-liner in the wiki, but there are some very 
nice D-trace hacks that we can show people for like running applications on production. Uh, it's, it, it, would, it could be very fascinating to see. Just yesterday, by the way, Michael, we were debugging, uh, uh, we were debugging, um, what the hell were we debugging? We were debugging OpenSense. Oh, really? Or Josh, Does it or have D-trace enabled? Of course. I'd hope so. And yeah. And, and like, oh my God, why is this directory filled with 200,000 files? Goodness. Yeah. And just immediately I fired up Dtrace and filtered out the directory and like, oh, there you go. Send mail. Of course it's oh, send mail. So wait, on your yeah, router? Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. On the router. The mail yeah, queue was filled apparently. So uh, yeah, like tiny things, daily things, and it could save an ops week. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Eight plus seven, that's 15. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I no longer trust my math. Okay, so there's food for thought. Um, yeah. Uh, I, gosh, we should at least look at that book and see what it gets right. Maybe, I don't know if Drew's in the mood to work on a book. No idea. But something between that and the Linux or the FreeBSD command line or BSD command line would be quite useful. Those are just invaluable um Antrenig, later this week uh come say thursday i think my head will explode so i might need you to manage this i've got an event thursday through Monday. behind call i'll host it no worries um so yeah uh anything else at this time or that was a pretty darn good talk and a, a conversation i'm glad we got philosophical always helpful because just think of the points on the message out there that, oh, we, you know, we get our reliability through all these moving parts. And we BSD people are like, uh, that scares me. <laughs> more parts, more problems, more dependencies, more possible you mean, incompatibility. There are two ways to not have bugs, right? Either you make it so simple that it obviously has no bugs, or you make it so complex that it has no obvious bugs. Fair <laughs> <Right>. Yep. <laughs> That's a very lovely one. Yeah, okay. It's, it's not mine, but yes. <laughs> and for the public record, Comcast, a multi billion dollar internet provider, has given me three answers on what a network configuration is for a client. And I'm beside myself. Like, what is wrong with you people? I don't know. Anyway. Didn't you just say that? It's Comcast. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then as per that chat that I think Antonig and uh, Jan, you saw, I, I, Levi and I can reproduce some Mikrotech bugs, which kind of is disappointing for those who have names like Chromage and <laughs> Embarrassing. Okay. See you all uh, tomorrow or next week. Yes. And uh, should I do the honors? Yes, please. Like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. That was a great call. So, uh, Thanks. Michael. Hold tight. Did you, know, you, uh, nice, lovely goodbyes. We're going to say bye, everybody. Anyone? Anyone? Jeez. Oh, bye, everybody. There we go. Bye, yeah. everybody. <laughs> I'll probably leave that in. See ya. <laughs>